One, two, one, two. Okay, well, thank you for coming to view the film. Some of you have come specially to see the film, and some have been here earlier on uh, to view and listen to the panel and take part in some of the discussions. This is another opportunity uh, for people that have come here to take part in the continuation of discussion, uh, especially regarding the film that you've just seen. Uh, my name is Mark Garrett, so I'm part of a kind of uh, group called Furberfield in, based in London, and uh, I think that's probably all you need to know about me, but I think the important thing is to introduce the filmmaker, which is uh, Tonya hessen Shay. Good, I got that right. And obviously, Brandon Bryant. And, uh, well, I, the first question is to you, because uh, I just wanted to ask, and I'm gonna hand other questions out very, very quickly, but what does it feel like to have yourself, to see yourself on the film? Uh, and uh, it's almost like the reverse. You know, you're kind of now a part of the spectacle when, you, when, they, when you've got the kind of the spectacle of the drones that's viewing everyone else. Now you're being viewed. And so what does that feel emotionally? How are you dealing with that emotionally now that you've declared what you have, as we all know in the film? Um. That's a good question, actually. Um, when I started doing this, I did it because I wanted people to judge me. I wanted people to see what I had done, and I wanted people to understand that what I had felt and was regret. And I, I deemed myself uh, to need punishment or need some sort of judgment from the rest of the world. But now that I, like, he brings up a good point, like, I, I was observing people for about five years, and now people are observing me. And it, it feels fitting. It feels like, you know, um, I think that you know, with the whole secrecy behind the program and my devaluation of what secrets actually mean towards, you know, human progress, that it, this needs to be observed in its entirety, and if that means that I have to stand out into the public, then that's what it means, and um, so it feels like it fits. Yeah, and I wanted to, you know, throw in something about the film, obviously, because that seems such a, uh, a high-quality film, you know, really well executed, and, uh, and it's so refreshing to see a good-quality documentary film uh, with a a broad context going across, but I mean, what does it take to make a film like that? And you know, what did it, does it take in you? Well, thank you, that's, uh, that's very kind. Um, <clears throat> I think um, what it takes, I mean, mostly it takes having uh, a tremendously uh, good team. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, persistence, patience. I definitely don't have a lot of patience. Um, but having a lot of a uh, lot of good people around. Uh, I mean, we started out as uh, well. First, I had the idea, and then we were two people uh, developing the idea, and then we became, you know, we we joined this uh, pretty small production company in Norway, and really started building up the the team internationally uh, in in Pakistan, in the States, in uh, in Europe, uh, and uh, at the the most we were like 42 people uh, working on this team. But then most importantly, it takes working with um, amazing characters like Brandon, who, uh, who have the courage and uh, are willing to take the risk to, to speak truth to, to power. And it has been uh, an incredible honor uh, and an amazing journey to, to get to know you, Brandon. So thank you. Uh, I noticed in the film, I'm sure everyone's noticed that uh, you, you didn't have a tattoo on, on both arms. Could you just express what they symbolize to the audience? Um, so I, uh, I guess when, when I, so uh, I, I'm kind of like, I like symbolism. I like uh, what symbols can mean and what they represent. And when you get a tattoo on your body, it's, you know, kind of permanent, so it has to represent something, right? And I, I've gotten into a lot into Eastern 
practices as far as like what does what does it mean to be like Zen? What does it mean to, to meditate? And uh, what I learned is that you intake energy from your left and you give energy with your right. And so I felt like I needed a symbol on my left that represented war and destruction and the ultimate symbol of Yang, which is the red dragon, which is the emperor's symbol. Um, but also it represents from one of my favorite book series called The Wheel of Time, it represents a, a code of conduct between warriors called Ji Ito. And what it means is honor and obligation. Only a man can know the worth of his own honor and the depth of his own obligation. And I felt like I had an incredible depth of obligation to the rest of humanity, and I felt it was fitting. And so the left, my, eventually my left side will be tattooed completely as well as my right, and it will represent war and destruction. It'll be that energy that I have intake, have taken in from, you know, my experiences in the past. But then I, you know, as, as I was seeking kind of uh, healing, um, I came across, you know, my ancestry, my ancestors were, were uh, Irish, um, Celts, and then uh, beyond that, they were uh, Nords, uh, and so I kind of was doing this, like, what, what were the beliefs of my ancestors, and what, what does that actually uh, mean to me, because I no longer felt associated with the modern religion of Christianity, monotheism, or whatever, I kind of felt, you know, like the Buddhists, like everything is connected, everything is intertwined, and so I eventually found, I, I, was, I wanted the, the tattoos of the Druids, you know, like represent totemic, uh, cl closely related to the Native American stuff as well. But I ended up meeting some people who were spiritualists, tattooists, and they designed a tattoo for me uh, based off of uh, Futhark, which is old Viking runes. And uh, the bind rune on my hand represents protection and healing and guiding light. And I feel like that is, that is what I want to give to the world is, is some, in that sort of manner. And so it represents that so story of that journey of, of where it starts and where it will finish. Okay, so, uh, and this is kind of, uh, in a way, represented uh, a, a rebirth uh, of who you are. And, uh, and, and that rebirth, uh, just, you know, that the meaning of that rebirth is, is specifically, uh, is it connected to kind of defining a new self in contrast to the self before in respect to you come from a religious family and that kind of, the psychological kind of background that you had there and the kind of certainty of being in a place of power like in, a, in, the, mil in the military. Uh, this new place of power uh, is less organisational and, 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 and I just want to see what, what faith drives you like faith has driven him and if there is any Wow. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to get very. Uh, um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not religious. Uh, I mean, to me, uh, you know, um, I usually try to believe in, in uh, the best in people, uh, which I often find very, uh, you know, challenging. <clears throat> but I, I also feel that religion uh, often is uh, the, the root to uh, a lot of the evil that is going on in the world. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm not going to get it further into that. It's a long discussion that we could do over <laughs> some bottles of wine or something at some point. Okay, so what I'm going to do is give you a choice to say anything you fancy saying that I should have asked you. And then I'm going to throw it into the audience to ask their own questions. So, is there anything I should have asked? That is such a cheap question. <laughs> I know. Well, you know. Um, no, I'm, I'm actually really excited to, uh, to hear what the audience have uh, to say. Um, I've been traveling uh, with this film uh, and with uh, Brandon uh, for, uh, I mean, since uh, April in, uh, in last year. And uh, we've talked to audiences in, uh, in uh, Norway and uh, throughout Europe, uh, and most recently in, uh, in London at the, the Bertha Dock House. And, uh, it's very exciting to be here, and, uh, and just from the panel uh, today, uh, the level of knowledge on this issue uh, is very impressive in this room, and uh, I'm excited to hear, uh, hear your questions and your thoughts. Okay. I have a question. 
Um, for Tony, and I'm really interested in understanding, since I often work with networks and also relationship with people, um, how was uh, possible for you to um, get to know and access the people that are part of your film, especially in the zone of uh, the drone strikes? Um, was that difficult, like the community that were the victim of the drone strikes? How did you get in contact with them? And um, if you can tell us a bit more of uh, how these actually had Im impact in the society, how they were looking at you, it was easy to have information from them, uh, because of course we can imagine that uh, not all of them like to be filmed, or uh, maybe someone stay anonymous, or instead they like to speak, so I would like to know a bit more about that. Yes, um, <clears throat> it is very uh, hard to hear the, the questions from the audience. I don't know, it's some kind of reverb, but uh, you were asking about uh, how it was to work uh, with people in uh, Vasilistan. Yeah, and also how you uh, yeah, how it was the possible network. for you to access them, well, and if um, they accepted you easily. Well, basically, um, how we did our work in Pakistan is that we worked very closely with the Shahzad Akbar, who, uh, you know, um, started his work almost around the same time as we started the production of the film. So we had very close contact throughout. And uh, in the beginning of you know, the production, we didn't have any uh, funds to go to Pakistan. Uh, and we set up a team that worked very closely with, uh, with uh, Shahzad. And what we found is that working with uh, a local team, uh, we were able to do so much and, and act much, uh, much quicker uh, when things happened. Um, and also as a woman, as far as uh, interviewing uh, people from the tribal region, uh, it's almost uh, impossible. Uh, one of our uh, female line producers there, uh, whenever she would uh, interview, um, interview people from the city town, you know, they would look down and, and not really share their emotions. So Shasad did a lot of the interviews for us, uh, and we did work with, uh, with the, a local team uh, throughout the production as well as Chris Woods, uh, who went down and actually uh, went into Vasilistan with the, the Pakistani military. But some of the incredibly, you know, very high quality uh, footage from Vasilistan is from uh, Chris Woods, who also, uh, for people that weren't here during the panel, um, I mean, Chris, to me, is, is one of the foremost experts uh, on the drone issue. Um, and. His book, Sudden Justice, that just came out last week, uh, I think is, uh, is a masterpiece. It's also featuring uh, a lot more drone pilots that are actually uh, talking out on the issue and backing uh, Brandon up in, uh, in his uh, information. So that's very exciting. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Hello. Hi, um, congratulations, um, especially and like in concept, it's outstanding. Uh, my question is, it's rather more on the uh, on the political side. Did you ever, were you ever contacted by anyone from, say, U.S. government or like, uh, did you ever get any some sort of anonymous letters or if yes, what did they say? And also. Did you ever get any, like any other drone operators, like afterwards and also during the, any threats or something like this? Well, the only, uh, it's very hard to get the Obama administration to talk about this. Um, they did not want to, you know, uh, give any interviews at all. Um, so the only contact we had was when uh, we uh, released uh, an article in The Guardian uh, that me and Chris wrote together on the, the secret CIA squadron that uh, we hear about in the film. Um, and mostly we, we chose to work with The Guardian uh, to, to, do, to release this information in the best possible way uh, because we had never outed a whole CIA squadron uh, before. And we weren't sure, you know, what, what that meant. And we, we knew that, I mean, the information about this, this squadron was out in social media and it was, it was known, but not so publicly. Um, and Guardian has a protocol that they contact uh, CIA and CENTCOM and give them 72 hours to sort of uh, make an argument that this is uh, a threat to the U.S. security. Uh, and also in order for the squadron to kind of clean up some of their activity online. And um, we got a very sharp message back that this article should not be published and that the film should be stopped. 
but not a good argument that this actually was in fact a threat uh, by any means um, to the US. Um, other than that, it's been very, very much uh, silenced uh, in the US. Uh, it's, it's been incredibly hard to, to get the film out. Um, no US broadcaster is uh, willing so far to move forward. Uh, and it has been shown in, in over 20 countries worldwide. So, um, but we are going to the States uh, or to Toronto next week to one of the biggest uh, documentary festivals uh, where we really hope to, uh, to get some traction in the US because we really hope to get the film out there. Um, in Norway, we've, we've gotten some, some personal threats from, from the, the right wing side, but that's mainly talking about our Norwegian responsibility and role uh, in the war on terror. So, uh, I think uh, you said something earlier on regarding uh, that you got contacted, but I don't think the person that asked the question was here when you said that. So do you want to mention your experience? Um, people that weren't here before. Sure. Um, so <laughs> uh, about four weeks ago, four weeks ago I was contacted by the FBI and that was the first time anyone had ever contacted me from the US government. And I was sleeping and I get this phone call and I wake up and I'm like, it's a number from my hometown and I'm like, hello? And they're like, Mr. Bryant, this is the FBI. You're not in trouble. Um, so like, I, 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 kinda, I thought it was a joke at first and I was like, excuse me? And she's like, yeah, this is agent blah, blah, blah. Um, but you have, there is a radical group in Missoula looking for you right now and we just wanted to know where you were at. And I was like, well, I'm not in Missoula right now, so it's okay. And they're like, you're not in Missoula? Where are you at? And I'm like, I'm not gonna tell you guys. So that was, that was the first and only real true interaction that I've had with the US government. But they've, I think they've made my life pretty miserable as far as inter interfering with my veteran administration paperwork and for my physical injuries, not necessarily my PTS. Um, but anyone else, I've gotten contacted by Anonymous a few times saying that they support me, uh, or people claiming to be part of Anonymous uh, saying they support me. Um, I've gotten contacted by you know, uh, even some Taliban and Al-Qaeda members who were like, we might not like you, but you know, you're a good person. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, that's an interesting, interesting message that, I even ha I had a Russian dude message me and he's like, we are enemies, but you are honorable and I would be gladly fighting against you. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> Um, but actually, all the, all the hate messages that come to me are from Christian patriots and veterans who think that I've betrayed the country when, you know, it's our actions that have betrayed us, nothing that I've said that has betrayed anything. Um, I just wanted to ask, so um, two months ago they showed a movie in a shorter version on Arte in Germany. So did they ask you what they were cutting out of the movie or did you have any influence on what they are doing or did they it on their own to say the rest of the one third of the film we don't need in Germany, they don't will get it anyway? Um, no, I mean I, I love Arte, uh, the, the commissioning editor editor there was one of my mentors and, and one of the first people to actually come on board uh, as a broadcaster. Uh, and it has been uh, a pleasure to work with them the, the whole way. Um, very much not interfering with the content at all. But um, the slot is uh, on television is, uh, is very much uh, set in time. So uh, it had to be a 58 minute version. And, uh, and for us, that was our first deadline. So that's why the, the television version came out first. Um, but with this unique access and all the material and, and uh, you know, the human stories that we were sitting on as well as the, the amazing experts on this issue, uh, we really wanted to push through uh, to get a theatrical version that could have a, a wider reach. So that's the version you saw tonight. Uh, there was someone, just the, that, that person there, and then... Um, hi, great, uh, thanks for the film. Um, I was thinking about what it would be like to be a person that wants these drones to do what they do, and I realized that from their point of view, it would seem like Brandon and the pilots and the Air Force are the weakest link. Uh, you guys get PTSD, uh, you come out and make films and 
say stuff, and it's just a matter of time before you're not going to be there. Uh, the drones are going to be flying on their own, um, and the decisions will be sort of passed down to them, not to you, to pull uh, to pull the trigger. So, uh, do you, do you have any thoughts about that? And uh, would you mind sharing? Um, I guess the the first thing that I would like to say is. Uh, you know, the question is, why are we having this debate? Because we're taking the killing of another human being out of human hands. And there needs to be a burden for that. There needs to be a cost. Uh, spiritual, psychological, physical, whatever, whatever you want to label it as, there needs to be a cost. And yeah, the technology was already on that way. Um, predator drones have already been, uh, the hardware was already pro uh, uh, enabled to allow automatic flight and search, they just the software was not programmed to be so, at least when I was in. So you're looking at, you're looking at the debate more as um, involving individuals where it's the people who are in charge are making the decisions. So in reality, especially with uh, America is supposed to be a republic, right? So each person by himself on his own merit needs to speak out. And just because the, nor, everyone else thinks that something wrong is something right doesn't make it so. So it's everyone's responsibility that when we think that something's wrong to speak out. And that's the only way that the debate's going to progress uh, towards what we believe is right. So if you think that it's wrong that a robot be able to kill a human being through an algorithm of patterns of life, then it's, it's, it's wrong. But how can you, how can, I, I don't see how any normal thinking human being could agree with, with that sort of mentality, you know? Well, um, for me, uh, one of the most scary things with this production is, is seeing the, the amazing rapid rate uh, that this technology is developing at and, and the people uh, behind this technology and, and uh, you know, the, the lack of uh, ethics. Um, also, it's been pretty amazing to meet, you know, scientists that are, are um, arguing that, well, you know, it, could be possible to maybe have a machine be more ethical and, and better at being in a war because there would be no anger or hatred or revenge uh, clouding uh, the decision to kill. Personally, um, the thought of being killed by a machine with a killer algorithm pisses me off a lot more than actually being killed by a human being that hopefully goes through some rationale of, of decision-making process before killing. Um, and, th and that's something that I think if, if most people think about, they will uh, make that same decision, probably. Um, but I think the, the main issue here is that the, the, our institutions that we, we talk about in the film, like the United Nations and the process there, all the p institutions that are supposed to protect our human rights and make sure that the laws of war are being followed move at a, such a slow pace. And I'm, I'm afraid that we are not going to be able to keep up with the weapon industry and that they are the ones that are going like, to you know, decide what way we move forward unless we speak out. Um. Yeah, so on, to piggyback on that with the you know, talk of the United Nations and, and our governments, governments don't want to stop war. They just want to mitigate it so that they can continue, continuously doing it. And I don't believe, unfortunately, uh, that uh, any authority figure out there really has the authority to do anything, um, whether it's to progress war or to stop it. And that's where it comes down to individuals. Um, and so we need to we need to take a stand. It's not, it's not going to change if we, if we rely on some sort of politician to make some sort of deal. Because that's all they're going to do. They're just going to make deals with each other until they make it, make it big and get their pockets fat. And then where are we left? We're left with robots in the street and in the skies targeting us, surveilling us. We're, our privacy is gone. Uh, we're living in a dystopian future. We're living in 1984. Um, Okay, so uh, there's a question in there, then we have, there's a person in the back afterwards. So, yeah. yeah, my name is Daniel and my question goes to uh, Brandon. Um, as I'm fighting my own case since two years, um, which is related to the responsibility which German officials do not 
take uh, for prisoners of war. Um, since I tried to get answers since two years, I directly and publicly addressed uh, President Gauck, Ms. Merkel, Ms. von der Leyen. I talked to military officials and they simply refused to give answers. Um, and I, I, I kind of accept that they don't want to, to give answers, but uh, my question to you is, what kind of answers are you seeking? Because uh, I'm still not clear what kind of answers I'm seeking, but I, I'm definitely, I definitely want them to, to give answers. And what, what is your desire? What kind of answers uh, or what kind of statements do you want them to give to you? Um, I've already uh, asked the United States government to give me the information on my Hellfire shots and uh, missions that I participated in just so I can have some sort of closure with it. And I think my, my desire is to, my desire was to find peace with that. But I also realized that um, my desire in that was wrong because it was driving me insane. Like I, I wanted peace, like I wanted closure with that. And I, I realized that, it's, that this is a journey, not a destination. And I'll never find peace with my past if I just seek it out in the most unhealthy manner. So instead of you know, seeking the answers in that regard, I progressed forward and decided that I was going to prevent it from happening to anyone else. And I think that's where I found at least some semblance of peace was that I, I can walk forward confidently with my head held high knowing that you know people are having information the people over there know that i care people like they they know that i feel remorse for my actions and i'm trying to prevent it from happening more i might not get anywhere with it but at least i'm doing something about it uh, there was uh, someone at the back could, could we hear them someone put their hand up Uh, yeah, I, I just basically wonder why can the U.S. kill the people? Why? I mean, you said it in the movie, they are not in war with, the, with Pakistan, but they can fly and kill people without any investigation. How can this happen? I don't understand. That is a great question <laughs> because I think that they think... Pretty much everyone's asking that question, but um, like they said, like our, our idea or our justification for war is malleable because the, what we can say is this person is an imminent threat, but if, if they have not done anything other than post angry videos on YouTube and, and say, down with America, hashtag drone strike on Twitter or something like that, then that makes them an enemy of the state. And what we're getting to is if you're, if you're sort of critical of the U.S. government, or you've seen it all around the world, like critical, being critical of your government can land you in prison, can land you in, in severe punishment. And they're, they're doing it to make enemies, I think. Like, we're purposely making enemies to control the people of the United States. It's, it's perpetual fear, it's fear porn. Like, these guys are getting off on it, the leadership are getting off on it because they're, they know that they can't lose power as long as they can pretend that they're protecting us from some unknown threat that's, that, that we can't define. And so, because, because, in fact, actually, I don't think anyone in America is actually making this question. I don't know if anyone in America is making this question. It's all coming from outside sources. It's coming from people around the world ask questioning America rather than America questioning itself. Um, I have an additional qu question. So, and why is the Pakistani government not immediately shooting the drones that shoot they are people because, I mean, if a drone would fly to Berlin and shoot me um, and nothing would happen, it's not possible. I, I don't understand the legal... Well, here's the, here's the technical answer for that. It's impossible. Predator drones have very little heat signature, so you can't lock onto them with heat-seeking weapons. They're also flying at such an altitude and a slow enough speed that it's really... Um, 
impossible to hit them with any sort of other or weapons. There has been um, instances of uh, fighter, I think there was one fighter aircraft that shot down a drone in the Iraq conflict right at the beginning, but um, really there, there's nothing they can do. And so when you, when you hear them talking about how they hear the drones overhead, that's because that, that they, the, the United States government is doing that on purpose. It's called a show of force. It's saying, hey, we can be silent and, and hidden from you, and, but we're, we're making it known that we're here. And um, they're, the Pakistani government's official stance is that they're against what the United States is doing, but in reality, what they've ha they have allowed the United States to perpetuate this war because they don't have control of the regions that we're flying over, and they don't care. Just, yeah, I just I'd like to uh, to follow up very quickly. I mean, I think uh, you know what what is the United States not able to do? Um, I personally think that um, our silence and our ignorance and um, the lack of transparency around this issue uh, also makes it harder. But I definitely think that the the European silence in particular is allowing this to happen. Um, and uh, I don't think that the U.S. really gives, um, I'm going to try to, I don't think the U.S. ever really will care about what the U.N. Uh, says. <laughs> and, um, and unfortunately, unless, you know, we, we speak out, I mean, if you, if you looked at, I mean, I, I lived in the States for, for 17 years, and, uh, and, you know, a big part of uh, my heart uh, is in the States, uh, I think uh, the, the progressive movement in the States has some power to, to hopefully rise again. Um, unfortunately, getting Obama elected sort of, uh, you know, put so much effort and energy and time into, uh, into people's uh, lives that I think it's hard to convince the American left that what is going on now is really important to, to stand up against uh, and it's taking a long time to, to get people fired up. But um, and also just as far as the situation in Pakistan is incredibly complex uh, and very, very chaotic. Um, how the, the drone attack started there, definitely Musharraf had some you know, secret deals with the, the US and there were uh, killings where that you know, were uh, requested basically by the Pakistani military or um, government in the very beginning. Um, when he finally left, uh, you know, there was a, a long period of time where the official line, at least from the Pakistani government, was that this was illegal uh, and that it was a violation of international law, um, which is why it's been so amazing and important to follow the work of Shahzad and reprieve on the ground in Pakistan. Um, and to me, it's given a lot of hope to see how just such few people can actually get the whole world's attention onto the issue. Uh, by using, um, you know, incredibly um, creative ways uh, to deal with uh, the judicial system, to actually go up against the CIA and the Pakistani government and the U.S. government in cases. And I just want to say that um, one of the cases that we see the beginning of in this film is, uh, is uh, Shahzad's first case of uh, Karim Khan's um, loss of his, uh, his brother and his, um, his son. And that was Shahzad's first case. Um, and he just uh, last week uh, won this case in Islamabad where the, the judge now is saying that this case will be opened up against uh, the two uh, CIA officials um, that were in uh, charge in 2009 and they are now uh, charged with um, murder, terrorism and conspiracy. And that's really, yes, that's very, very encouraging. Uh, we have, an, yes, we have one there, and then we have the other one at the front afterwards. Thanks. As in person. <laughs> um, you, I wanted to ask two questions. One has been pretty much answered, like why are they doing it? And you said it's to control the people, to instill fear in the population, in the, in the American population. And they just create this arbitrary animus outside. Um, and I think the movie was really shocking and eye-opening, but um, also very frightening, especially since it's kind of obvious that you cannot really do much about it. Um, as you say, like, from a technical perspective, you're helpless. If, if the American government just decides your patch of land is enemy territory and we shoot you, whatever, arbitrarily, then what can you do? 
And um, I also noticed that in the movie, they, these officials that you screen were using this very weird medical language, like the infected tissue and this kind of stuff. And it reminds me very much of the fascist talk in the, in the Nazi time here. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of like a mental disease that they have. And I wonder what, what the, your message is besides, okay, this is terrifying, this is horrible, we have to stop this, but how can we pacify the, the minds of the people and give, take the fear away from them that, so that they don't see any en enemies all over the place, which are illusionary anyway. So how, how can this be overcome, this, this paranoia? That's, that's my question. Do you have anything pointing at that? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I, f I first think it's important to maybe, you know, um, just take like a breath and be like, you know, look what Shahzad and Reprieve have been able to do on the ground in Pakistan. It is possible to change things. And, and also, if you think about, I think it's important to, to get to know the language of, of the new war. And we, we talked about this in, in the panel uh, quite a bit. And I apologize for people have to, to hear myself, repeat myself. Um, but I think, you know, the whole, the whole speak around this new warfare, it's important to sort of um, tear apart and, and to, uh, to understand um, how maybe everybody in, you know, the mass public is, is maybe just buying into the notions of the drone being a, a perfect weapon in the war on terror. What is a civilian? How many um, militants are being killed compared to how many civilians are being killed? And, and really, um, how to get this message across to the wider public, uh, at least what we have found is, as soon as we start talking about you know, uh, our own role and responsibility in the war on terror, it seems like the, the media is sort of uh, waking up to this whole thing of it's actually making us less safe. Terrorism is starting to come in more and more to Europe, and this is uh, clearly a blowback of Europe's role in the war on terror. Um, so I think it's important to, to find ways to, to speak the language and to, to present information uh, um, in that way. Um, sorry, I lost my, uh, my train of, of thought, but I also, um, it's, you know, in the States, 66%, uh, around 66% around of the population supports the drone attacks. And I truly think that this is because they do not know what's going on. And as long as people don't know what's going on, you can do whatever you want. And if you, if you think about Europe's reactions to Guantanamo and, and the, the pressure that we put on Bush to, to stop Guantanamo and stop torture, and think about the silence that Europe now is showing to just simply um, assassinating people outside of hot battlefields with no questions asked, no transparency, and there's no accountability, and, and we are just silent. And I, uh, that I do not understand. Yeah, um, actually, it, it just became two questions. The first question is, um, do the United States have the technology to uh, shoot down drones? And um, because you said the, the Pakistani military uh, obviously doesn't, doesn't have it. Um, and the other question, uh, oh, I just forgot, sorry. Yeah, so just one question. Uh, I don't believe that the United States has really developed any anti-drone technology unless, I mean, there was, there, I mean, there was some theories thrown around like uh, hacking into the computer uh, uh, information data flow. You might not know what it is, but you can overcharge the, um, the basically send so much information onto, into the drone that it fries itself. And that's, that's entirely possible. You just have to be really clever with sort of technology. Um, uh, I don't know. It, it, it's an interesting... I know China has. China's developed anti-drone technology. And so um, that was kind of an issue when I was in where people were like, well, if we have to fly into China, we're not going to do it with the drones. We have to develop... Um, we, they were developing an autonomous bomber that they could basically program that would fly uh, faster than any other aircraft cause, ever because it has no human component in it. But uh, every time that they tried to get it above a certain speed, it would break itself apart. So um, 
I'm not sure the technolog uh, techno uh, technological advance of anti-drone warfare, um, but I, I guess I would assume that they've had something. Um, and to address the guy's previ the previous gentleman's uh, question about how do we get rid of the paranoia and fear involving this type of uh, deal, you just you just have to live your life. You have to understand that there are certain things that you can influence, and that you just love and care about the people around you, and and spread goodwill and compassion. Um, just try to live a good life, and. You know, if you feel like you can do something, do something. Or if you feel like you can encourage someone, encourage something. Uh, having fear is probably what causes people to not speak out. And we've got to figure out a way to get over our own fear individually before we can be uh, good contributors to this kind of cause. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to comment uh, when you said that Europe has been silent. Uh, Europe has not been silent in terms of words. It's only been silent in terms of deeds. In terms of words, uh, the, the great, the, our coalition government here, the SPD and the CDU, said in their uh, agreement, the coalition agreement that founds the government, that they consider extrajudicial uh, targeted killings unacceptable. And the, I've said some of you have been here, maybe heard some of this before, excuse me if it's a repeat for anyone, but the European Parliament uh, in February of last year, with an overwhelming vote of over 500 against 47, uh, said that, again, that the, these targeted killings are uh, illegal, that they cannot, uh, and they also uh, uh, urged the member states not to support the targeted killings and in fact to pursue them legally. Now I feel that Germany is kind of an irony of history. It's the 70th uh, anniversary uh, of the end of World War II and Germany has been given, as we've learned recently in the press and over the last year, it's not all in your film, Germany has been given the power to restore the rule of law. No other nation in the world has as much power as Germany right now if they would say you may not use Ramstein anymore for these targeted killings. It could be that the US would outflank it. Uh, it could be they would build something in Italy or wherever or Egypt. But right now, Germany could stop this and say we insist on the rule of law being reestablished as was agreed after World War II. So um, I think it's a question of how we can take this, shall we say, this responsibility and this blessing. I should say that my, I grew up in the States, but my father came from Germany, and I always heard how terrible the Germans, my grandparents were here during the war. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for Germany to do something really great for the world right now. Yes, I agree. Um, I'd like to just point out that I don't trust words over deeds. I mean, look at President Obama. He said so, many, so much bullshit and he's never backed anything up and he's gone against what he said. So until a politi I, I trust no politician, especially politicians in the United States who are anti-drone, I've contacted them and they've told me they don't want to speak with me. So until someone actually does something, I will not trust anything that anyone says. Can I ask what you, what you want them to do literally, you know, uh, in response to what the person's just said there? Any ideas, what, what would, what would they do? What would they have to do other than Germany? What, would, what needs to be done? I would, I, I would like to see someone cut the fiber optics cord that's running underneath the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Um, I think that what, what needs to happen is just pressure. Um, it, if Germany needs to evict the United States from their country. We, they need, like, someone, someone needs to take a stand against the bully in the schoolyard. And Germany is in the position where, you know, they were the right-hand man of the bully, but the bully kind of stabbed him in the back. And it's time to, you know, stand up. Well, I think it's, uh, it's, 
you know, one thing is that, you know, uh, there's um, in meetings and, and, and little small uh, maybe uh, blips in the media that uh, there's been votes and there's this, this stance. I think that's, uh, that's very different than actually demanding uh, transparency and accountability. Um, and, and walking, uh, working pretty closely with ACLU during this, this process, and, and Hina Shamsi is, uh, you know, uh, such a brilliant woman. And she, you know, she just told me that she's trying to travel to Europe and to meet with European politicians as much as possible um, right now, just to, to try to put pressure to, to make people understand how it, important it is to do this now. I mean, this is Obama, who is the president. Um, and look what he has done, you know. Uh, what's coming, we have no idea. Uh, but the standard that the U.S. Uh, and the, has been setting with the CIA's use of drone, I think is incredibly dangerous. Um, and it's going to be very, very hard for us to point our finger at anybody else who decides to take out whoever they assume to be uh, imminent threats around the world. Uh, so if we don't do anything now, uh, when? Uh, if the line hasn't, shouldn't be drawn now, then when? Um, and I don't feel that that is a proper debate that we're having here in Europe. It's definitely not happen happening in the States. And that's something that I really, really hope that this film can uh, help happen. And, and so far in, in Norway, uh, we have gotten a lot of attention in the media. We've shown it to the, the Norwegian parliament that are, have promised to you know, uh, take this uh, case further. We've gotten the Norwegian military um, on the ball to actually come out and say that this film is incredibly important, this issue is important uh, to, to talk about. So, but it happens very slowly. Um, and I, I just think it's important to, to do things like this, to network and to talk and to, to also think bigger maybe than we do. I think it's important to, to set high goals and just run as fast, fast and hard as you can. But also to think about that there is a growing big international network uh, and I think on the left side we often uh, forget to connect with each other internationally. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. Uh, we've got a question just over there, and then we'll go to you over there. Yeah, thank you. I just remembered my, uh, the second question I had, which is, um, are uh, drone strikes actually effective? Are they actually doing what, what uh, the like, military uh, is saying they do? Because on one hand, you have, uh, you have them say that they uh, kill a lot of the core um, of the Al-Qaeda uh, leadership, but on the other hand, you have um, people saying, uh, for every four people you kill, you get 10 more into the uh, militia. And um, I mean, there have to be like internal investigations in the, in the um, uh, US military that has actually to, to look into uh, what, what they're actually achieving and, and what harm they're, they're doing. Uh, there's, there's none. There is no invest unless someone crashes an aircraft or can kills civilians and it is reported into the news and the United States has to respond to it. There are no investigations internally. In fact, uh, as far as I know, as far as I remember, we're told that we are killing bad guys and we're making the world a safer place. That's it. I'm pretty sure that no one that's in the program right now will ever see any of these videos that will be released and if they do they're gonna they're gonna hate me for it because they're gonna be like oh that's not true this is what we're told but they've not done the research they've not read the reports and if they have and they're still in then they're they're fucking psychopaths well I think that's that's the the whole notion that um, the mass media is selling is that this is an uh, effective way to to kill uh, terrorists uh, in hard to reach uh, places. Uh, and if we don't put names to the numbers and, and figure out who they are actually killing, um, we are not doing our job. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that's why the, the work of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism is so important. Uh, we have worked closely with them dur during this pr production. And I think uh, their naming the dead pro project is, uh, is, uh, is 
brilliant and yeah, if you don't know about it, you should check it out. Um, but I think that, you know, actually talking about this as far as, you know, how, I mean, to me, the drone strikes are just putting fuel on the fire. Uh, not to even think about what it does to the, the population in these areas where they have to live under the drones. I mean, the drones to me is actually terrorism on the highest level, where the whole population is being terrorized um, and living in constant fear. Uh, and that's also stories that we don't hear about uh, in the mass media very often. So. Um, to me, it's a very, very dangerous long-term strategy that is uh, making our world uh, much less safe for everybody. Uh, I just wanted to cut in slightly. Uh, I just think that this, uh, well, the, your film uh, demonstrated clearly uh, of how, uh, you know, are, are these people that are making so much money out of these drones and military that they're, you know, sending to the, to the armies and stuff like that. You know, uh, who's going to feed them? It's almost like their greed and desire to make the, the best weapons that, you know, and it just seems like how are you going to stop people like that that have got the, uh, an ear to Congress or to, they can lobby that they've got the money to, uh, pay lobby groups, you know, just the same as climate change denials, that kind of weird where they can actually have total control of what's said within a democracy, which is, uh, and the whole process is undemocratic in the first place. You know, I, I actually personally believe that lobby groups are, should be illegal and any sort of money in politics should be taken out. Because if you vote someone into office and they're taking money from some sort of group to vote a certain way or to add a certain sort of program, I mean, that, that's, that's not a democratic process. It's not, it's not what we're actually supposed to be about. So um, this is kind of where I go, I like reverse surveillance, where everyone that decides that they want a piece of power, whether they're congressional members, parliament members, presidential members, whatever, they need to be under constant surveillance, surveillance 24 hours, and everything that they do while they're maintaining power needs to be made available to the public. And that will keep them in check. That would keep some, that, because what that does is it, it makes sure that they are being public servants. And if they do something that is completely unsatisfactory, they need to be removed from office immediately. There needs to be that. If they're going to be in that sort of position, there needs to be some sort of check. And we've got that ability with our current uh, level of technology. And here's where, I, here's where I would support someone like a group of people like Anonymous or anyone else out there that, um, uh, would do this. Like, I would just say, hey, why don't you guys just monitor every single member of uh, the U.S. Congress and House of Representatives and then post all that shit online? I like that. That's an awesome thought. <laughs> um, I also think that should probably go for the, the weapon industry. Um, I think of all the people that I met throughout this production, uh, Meeting this pioneer in the in the in the drone industry was uh, the most difficult interview. Um, I, I spent a day with him, and that was uh, that was. Uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, to to some uh, to some degree, and 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 we I, I just have to say we emailed back and forth for for two years before he agreed to to uh, give me an interview. Um, but, but to some extent, you know, he, he, his thing is basically, I don't care what I make, uh, it could be toilet paper or weapons, as long as I'm making money, there is the need. And I really think that uh, there's something about his, um, his uh, line of, of logic as, you know, as if you're gonna have a warrior, you need to give him the best possible technology you, you have. Uh, and to some extent, you know, that's an easy logic to follow. Uh, the reason, or the, the, and also, I mean, his whole complete lack of, uh, of uh, respect for ethics was uh, also very interesting. Um, but I think that um, as long as the weapon industry uh, and the military industrial complex has as much freedom as they do today, I think it's, it's this, uh, we humans, we have this uh, innate, ability to, to always want to explore like how far things can go. 
And I think it's almost impossible to stop this technolo uh, technological advancement unless there's a huge, massive movement against, against it and, and very strict laws and, uh, you know, things in place to, to uh, make sure that they are, are following these rules. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. And, uh... A question to Brandon. Um, I was wondering whether uh, at the time that you were a drone operator, did you witness uh, fellow drone operators uh, refusing to execute um, strikes? Um, well, here, here's a story about a, a young girl. Um, she, she's actually, like, we kind of, her and I have been in a disagreement since I started talking out. Well, she doesn't disagree with what I said, but she disagrees with the method that I've done it. But I have to say that I really admire what she did. And she took her, she took a shot because she kind of believed, you know, what we were doing and what we were up against. She, she didn't really want to, but she took it anyway. And then afterwards, she was like, I'm never going to shoot again. You can do whatever you want to me, but if I'm in a position to shoot, I will never take that shot ever again. And then she was like, I'm going to go see a psychologist too. So she was the first, she's actually, she's actually probably the one of the first people that I knew that actually stood up for herself in the drone world. And so she went and saw a psychologist. I didn't see her for about a month and a half, maybe two months. And then she came back and started flying again and nothing happened. They didn't take her clearance from her. They didn't kick her out. They didn't give her dishonorable discharge. And that, that, that was in middle of 2010, maybe, end of 2010. And it, it, it blew my mind because I'd never seen someone actually succeed in, in, in progressing past leadership. Because uh, when I had done it, I'd seen other people do it, and they'd be like, you're going to do it because if you don't do it, someone else will, and, and we're going to dishonorably discharge you, kick you out of the military, we're going to take away your security clearance, and your life will be fucked. And so... No one wants, no one, like, if, if that happens, like, if you get a dishonorable discharge from the U.S. military, you're worse than a felon. So you, there, you can't get work. You're basically, you're basically forced to fend for yourself. And uh, this girl did it. And um, uh, I've never got to told, tell her this, and hopefully she might see this video at some point. But uh, I really admire you uh, for what you've done, Sam. And uh, I hope that uh, you progress in that manner because it, it gave me courage that when I finally needed to step out and, and do something, I kind of remembered what she did. And uh, but that was the only time that I'd ever seen. Uh, I, actually, uh, we're going to go back further to when I was in training. There were two people that filed for conscientious objector status and uh, they were denied and they were just put in a back room to file paperwork for the rest of their enlistment. And so um, that was kind of a fear factor too, was if you wanted to get out of the program because you felt uncomfortable, they were just, they weren't going to let you go and they were going to just, you weren't going to get promoted, they were just going to put you away in the back room and you were just going to be left to rot. And I think that's how they really control most of the members of the drone community is through fear and intimidation. Oh, we've got time for another one. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, there was one over there, but there's one over there. So, can someone get a mic? Okay, a mic over there then. The woman with blonde hair. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Brendan Bryant. Uh, have you ever considered turning in yourself to the International Criminal Court to, for war crimes? So, just a sense more, um, as much as I admire what you speak out and what you do, and suggest somebody else cut the fiber optic cables, I cannot believe you think it's just that if I go out and murder somebody, I go to jail, and you choose to redeem yourself spiritually. So, also, don't you think that that would set um, very powerful precedent as a U.S. citizen, former drone operator, being identified for a war crime as in drone strikes? Um, actually, I did. Um, I stood in front of the U.N. Actually, you saw it in the film, if you watched it. Uh, and I had, we had hung out with some of the lawyers previously that were working there, and I had told Sarah Nucky, who um, was on the, the council, I said, if you wanted to persecute me for war crimes, I, I, I admit I'm an international war criminal with what I've done, and I, if it, someone wanted to persecute me under war, uh, a, a, a criminal tribunal or whatever, I wouldn't stop them. I wouldn't. 
Um, but she said that it was not necessary because it would just be showboating and uh, it wouldn't actually get anything accomplished. So I'm doing what I can now to, like, you, you said it was unfair that I had found a spiritual redemption and, and not done something like that, but that was part of the process, was because, like, I felt, you know, I felt pun needed, I needed to be punished. I came out in front of the world and said, uh, uh, this is what I had done, punish me. And I was told, hey, uh, thanks for revealing this to us. We're not going, like, you're, we're not going to punish you for it. And that actually made me feel worse. If, if you can believe that. And so now I'm, I'm trying to do everything I can uh, uh, to, you know, make up for it. Like, if I'm not going to be punished under some sort of, of law, which I don't even believe in the rule of law, to be honest. I'm more anarchist than anything else the more that I progress through, through this journey of life. And so I feel like if someone's going to punish me, it's going to be you guys. It's not going to be some, some bullshit official who has no no idea what the hell's going on other than some rules that are made up to, to keep people in line. It's going to be actual punishment from somebody. And I, I, that's why I go, I walk around and I don't fear for my safety because if someone attacks me in the street and they feel like it's justified, well, then uh, they obviously haven't listened to what I've been saying or what I've tried to do and they're just, they're just making the problem worse. And the only way the only way to fix the problem isn't to do, it isn't to stand in front of a judge and, and, or a jury and to, to make an example of myself. The only way to fix this problem is to actually get your hands dirty and, and, and work on it, like, and actually do something about it. If, if I, what, what am I going to do if I'm going to be sitting in prison, right? What, what, what would I accomplish? I would be able to do nothing. I wouldn't be well, able to talk. I wouldn't be able to spread any sort of I, message. I, I actually think it's a really difficult question to answer, even for someone who's not you. <laughs> because, like, uh, it's, uh, it's done now. You know, it's been done. And uh, there's, you, you can't undo it. And who's, who's really, after, after, you know, my experience, who's going to punish me worse than myself? Really? Who's going to punish me worse than myself? Because I, had sat, I have sat there with a gun in my mouth ready to pull the trigger and I couldn't do it. I have, I have you know, I, I've, 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 I've realized that, that that's an easy way out. That, that's too easy. If I'm going to do some sort of uh, a redemption or, or some sort of uh, atonement, for whatever crime that I've committed, that I believe that I've committed, I need to work on it. I need to be given the opportunity to change things from a physical and mental and spiritual standpoint. I need to be able to set the example of this is what I believe, this is what I've done, and this is what I'm going to do to change it. That's the only way that things are going to get better. Uh, have you got anything to say yourself on that? Oh, wow, that was, um, you know, when it comes to, to responsibility uh, for, for what is being done uh, in, in the war on terror and in the, the drone war, uh, I really feel that we need to look to where the decision is being made, where the order comes from. Um, and that goes all the way to the top. Uh, and I think that's where we, we really need to look. And I also think it's incredibly important to acknowledge the kind of courage it takes to, to speak out like Brandon is doing. And for over a decade, Brandon has been the only voice from the inside of the drone program. And the way that you share your story and, and your um, incredibly bravery to, to be the very, very important whistleblower that you are uh, should demand uh, an amazing amount of respect uh, and gratitude from all of us. So. Uh, so, and I just want to say something, so where I come from, which is a very kind of working class background, you know, it's normal for, uh, for my class to uh, go in the army or, or go into the navy because there's, there's not many jobs, you know, that, that, you, that, that you, you, you can't go to college because the, the education is so bad. And uh, that's a normal thing to do, you know. So, and uh, the, there's a real form of social engineering that's going on in the background there, 
where you're breeding people to be dysfunctional in a way that's, that's been kind of engineered. And we know this, we know this stuff. And so when someone actually just doesn't fit into that mold and they don't know that they fit into that mold until when it was like, suddenly just happens, you know, it's almost like a, a sleeper, you know, you're just kind of just woken up. But some people are, are asleep all their lives and, uh, and never wake up. And I'd say that they're the people that the ones we need to, really need to worry about and the ones that, like you say, at the top, they're asleep. It's when it's the people that are awake, they're the ones that need to connect and form affiliations and make changes, uh, whatever degrees they of difference they may be. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter. You know, about whether there's a kind of uh, egotistical or narcissism involved, or, or kind of or opposite to that, or religion. We know it's wrong. You don't need an ac academic to tell you what you saw on that screen to be wrong, in your heart you know it's wrong. We all do. Because it's the people that have no hearts. And uh, so anyway, go on. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you want two mics? <laughs> I just uh, want to say thank you for allowing me to uh, speak to you guys, and I want to thank again uh, uh, Tatiana and the Disruption Lab uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk with highly intelligent and challenging people, and um, you know, uh, I hope that you all got out of this what I got out of it. <laughs>